Hey folks, so today we are going to talk about within group norms. We are recording from my lab today because of, there's a power outage in my apartment. So yeah, within group norms. Let's dive in, maybe, perhaps. Okay, so uh, within group norms, standard practice for tests is to develop some kind of within group norm. These are often kind of contrasted with developmental regularities, what we talked about last time. And um, here, just to give you a definition, um, the idea is to evaluate an individual's performance in terms of the most nearly comparable standardized group. These standards have to be uniform, clearly defined with quantitative meaning, and those quantitative meanings have to be able to be used in most statistical analyses. And this uh, norm group can be age-based, grade-based, as I talked about last time. Uh, these are often expressed in terms of percentiles or standard scores. So percentile scores express an individual's relative position in terms of the percentage of persons whose scores fall below that individual. And standard scores, it expresses the distance between an individual score and the group mean in terms of standard deviations of the distribution of scores. Cool. Okay. So I've already reviewed how to transform basic scores, but I would like to emphasize that this is a skill you will need in this class. So the most basic score is the z-score, which can be derived linearly through an equation that uses mean and standard deviation of the normative group to set up the new scale. So essentially any score can be normalized. And that is by obtaining the, mass, the matching cumulative distribution of a score from a normative sample. So you can go from percentile to z-score, z-score to percentile. It's pretty straightforward. Both of these scores can be further transformed into scales that are more convenient, such as the t-score, uh, staining, stens, c-scale, or deviation IQs. I encourage you to check those out. They're pretty well detailed in the book. Now, a percentile, I know I already said this, but I'm going to say it again, because this is something that is probably going to be useful to you. Uh, so a, cent, a percentile or centile, if you want to be that guy, um, indicates the value below which a given percentage of observations in a group falls. So the 20th percentile means that 20% of observations are below that value. And percentile rank is essentially the score and uh, blah, 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 blah. I cannot read. So the percentile rank of a score is the percentage of scores in its frequency distribution that are equal to or lower to it. Cool. So you can view percentile ranks in terms of normal distribution. So like one standard deviation above puts you at the 84th percentile, two puts you at the 98th, three puts you at the 99.9th percentile. You may have heard of this thing called like Six Sigma, which I have opinions, but what they're trying to convey there is that uh, they are six standard deviations above the mean. Yeah, that's what they're trying to convey because that Greek letter is Sigma. Cool. So you can um, convert these relationships between raw scores, z-scores, and relative standing really of any distribution. However, it's really good to know that um, just because you turn it into a percentile doesn't actually change the shape of the distribution. So if you have a slightly skewed distribution um, or just distributions of various shapes, you can get very different percentages above and below, as I've illustrated here in this figure, where a 40 puts you at the 92nd percentile, which means that only 8% of scores are above that because of how the distribution is, versus um, a 68, which is higher than a 40, um, only puts you at an 84th percentile. So it's important to know what the data look like so you can compare them and figure out what is happening. Cool, 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 cool. 
Okay, so I produced a diagram here that gives you some illustrations of how you can easily convert in between raw score transformations across a T-score, Z-score, uh, IQ score, and a couple others. These are good to know. Fun facts. Cool. They'll, they'll save you a lot of time if you have to just get a good sense of where someone's standing is, just from raw scores or standard scores, things like that. All right. So now let's actually like talk about some stuff that you likely aren't familiar with. So growth charts. So these are national norms or age-based national norms. The ones I've got as samples up ahead are uh, pediatric growth charts. And these are used by pediatricians, nurses, and parents to track, track the growth of their infants, kids, adolescents, all the kinder variants. And these are have been available in the United States since 1977. You are welcome to check them out. They're pretty cool looking. And what a growth chart is, is a, a series of percentile curves that illustrate the distribution of a selected body of measurements of kids. Uh, let's peek ahead for a little bit. This is what they look like. We'll come back because I got to talk to you about national norms and stuff. So as the name implies, national norms are derived from a normative sample that was nationally representative of the population at the time of the norming study. Um, in the fields of psychology and education, for example, national norms may be obtained by testing large numbers of people representative of different variables of interest, such as age, gender, race, ethnicity, background, socioeconomic strata, geographical location, and in different types of communities like rural, urban, suburban, et cetera. And in particular, if these tests were designed for use in schools, norms are likely gonna be obtained from students in every grade at which that test is aimed to be applicable. So factors related to the representativeness of the school um, from which the members of the norming sample are drawn may also be criteria for inclusion or exclusion from the sample. For example, if in this school, the student attends a publicly funded, privately funded, religiously oriented military school or something else, those are good pieces of information to know so that when you are comparing a score from that sample, you know what the score tells you. And you can ask the kinds of questions like how representative are the teacher pupil ratios in this school, like were those taken into account? Does the school have a library? If so, how many books are in it? These are the types of questions that can be raised when assembling a normative sample that can be used for national norms. So the precise nature of the questions raised when developing these norms will depend on whom the test is designed for and what the test is designed to do. And um, norms from many different tests may all claim to have nationally representative samples. However, you still have to really look closely at the description of the sample employed because it may reveal that that sample differs from many important aspects with respect to even other similar tests that are also claiming to be nationally representative. So it's important to know what is actually in the scale, like where the data are, as much information as you can get, because nationally representative depends on a lot. And uh, for example, in a data set I work with called the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, it was sampled in uh, 1978. And it's great as a, a representative snapshot of uh, adolescents in the United States between ages like 13 and 17. And as a consequence, it's a pretty decent snapshot because uh, it keeps following them over time. But you have to caveat every interpretation in terms of what norms you're considering. So whenever I talk about this study, I have to say as uh, sampled in 19, 1978. But these are all really important questions to ask. But recognizing those differences is important and allows you to make good judgments. Okay, so here is a tiny little, I'm gonna zoom in. I'm gonna zoom in. Yeah, 
to kind of illustrate these norms. These norms contain a lot of information packed in. So I encourage you to crawl deeply in here where uh, this data includes both length, because when you're a baby, people just measure how long you are rather than asking you to stand up because you're a baby and you can't do that. Uh, and so they compare length with height to look at percentiles and give really great kind of various measures. So 95th, 90th, 75th, 50th, 25th, 10th, and 5th. And anything below that 5% is still something to look out for, just as anything above that 5% or 95% is also something to look out for. And so there's a lot of information packed into these tables, which I think is pretty brilliant. But this is not a data visualization class where you're trying to condense as much information into as tiny space as possible. But I think you're pretty good at it. Cool, cool, cool. So we're wrapping up uh, within group norms. Next, uh, well, I'll see you in a bit. I'm gonna have some of my coffee. <laughs>